if you've seen Adam, let me know, because <laughs> it could be all a right, quick then. service. All right, come on. Roman soldier coming through. Get out of the way, slave. Come on. I know your type. What have the Romans ever done for us? Cheeky. Yeah, come on. Oh, man, oh, man. What a day I've had. And oh, love, love, I'm home. I'm home. Yeah, it's me, your beloved. I'm home. Oh, I've been guarding that Paul again. You know the one, the follower of the way. I've been chained to him all day long. And you know that Paul, he does love his letters. Yesterday, he was dictating one to the Colossians. Today, oh, today, man, he's doing one to the Ephesians. And it's going to go all the way around Asia Minor. So off he goes, and he's starting going on, as usual, about grace and peace and all these great spiritual blessings. I tell you what, when Paul, Paul went to rabbi school, nobody taught him punctuation because his sentences went on and on and on. Man, and then halfway through the letter, he's starting to pray. What? He's praying that they know the power of God that they have that raised Jesus from the dead. I couldn't believe it. But get this, get this. When he stopped praying, he starts back again and he says, you were once dead, but now you're alive. I don't know what he was on about. He said that they were brought back to life by the death of Jesus. What, what's that all about? He said they were saved by grace through faith. And then he said that these Ephesians were God's work of art. I, I don't know about that, Paul. I think he's been locked up too long. Then he's saying, then he's saying that they were Jews and Gentiles. They were united as one. And that he was the special messenger to the Gentiles. Yeah, love, that's me and you. Yeah, yeah. He said he was our special messenger. And then... I thought it was over, but he's back praying again. And in this time, he's praying about how deep and how wide the love of God is. Thank the Lord for lunchtime. Cool. We had our sandwiches then for lunch. And after lunch, he starts with one of his big, therefore. And you know what? I've always been told when you see a therefore, you ask what the therefore's there for. A wise Welshman once told me that. So he starts talking about how we're one in Christ. And then he starts talking about taking stuff off and putting stuff on. I thought he was going to do a strip tease. I was like, calm down, Paul. It's all right. But, but thank the Lord. Then he starts talking about wives and husbands and children and parents. You and the kids should be in there for that bit, I tell you. Then... He's talking about slaves and masters. I felt like I should have brought the commanding officer to listen. But then it got really weird. At the end, he starts looking up and down at me. I thought, come on in, Paul, let's have you, come on. And he's looking at my armor and then he starts talking about a spiritual battle. And he's talking about, he started looking down there and he was talking about my belt of truth. And I was like, hey, 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 Paul, hey, hey, hey. And he's talking about my breastplate and my helmet and my sword. And I thought things were going to kick off for a minute. But thankfully, he went back to all that grace and peace business. And then Claudius turns up at last. It was the end of my shift and I got to come home. Apparently tomorrow, love, he's doing one to Philemon. I hope that's a short one. Anyway, what's for tea? Um, why don't we turn to each other? That, that was the story of Ephesians through the eye of the Roman soldier that Paul was to, uh, chained to. Why don't you, you've been having a series of Ephesians for the last two months, turn to one another and tell them something that you've learned over these weeks, either from the talks on Ephesians, from your small groups, from reading the book of Ephesians. If you're a guest today, do find somebody and ask them. Feel free to interrogate them. So for 60 seconds, something you've learned on the book of Ephesians. All right, let's come back together. Yeah, if you put the next slide up, that'd be great. Today, 
we're going to look at Paul's concluding words and look at what it means to be strengthened to stand. A lot of you will be familiar with this passage because it contains the description of the armor of God, which we've heard lots of talks about. In fact, in about 2010-11, I did a series on the armor of God with the youth. And one of the youth, Nathan Philpot, came up with that amazing drawing of the armor of God in sort of manga style, which we used throughout the series. So today we're going to talk about our strength, our struggle And our stand. Now, there's been lots of books written on the armor of God. In 1655, William Gunnell, the Puritan minister, wrote The Christian in Complete Armor, which was 1,500 pages. Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones wrote The Christian Warfare and the Christian Soldier, which was over 700 pages. Today, I've got 25 minutes. So it's going to be, let's go for it. Let's, um, Have a look at our strength, our struggle, and our stand. Let's look at those key verses then on the armor of God and have a look at the next slide and read together. It says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Let's start and have a look at the next slide by talking about our strength. Paul starts his final words by saying, be strong or be strengthened in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, does anybody know who this is? It's Eddie Hall, yet Stoke on Trent's finest son, forget Robbie Williams, it's Eddie Hall. Every Christmas, I'm sure you, like me, watch the world's strongest man. And in 2017, Eddie became the world's strongest man. These are the strongest human beings on the planet. But God wants us to have strength in him and in the power of his might, which is far mightier than any strongman could be. Don't get it wrong. Paul is not saying in these verses, you know, it's time to toughen up, man up, woman up. He's not saying that. He's saying be strengthened in God and in God's power. Be strengthened in our union with Christ Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, which was the power that raised Jesus from the dead. But that doesn't mean we don't take action. We're to present ourselves before God, to ask him to fill us with his power. We're to seek God's face. And today you might be feeling anything but full of strength. You might be feeling tired, beaten down, weak and empty. And this is an opportunity as family today to lay hands and pray for each other, that we be filled with the Spirit, that we be filled with the power of God's might. So how does Paul say we gain strength and spiritual power from from Jesus? He says in verses 11 and 13, put on the full armor of God. I love one translation of verse 13 says, so put on God's armor now. Notice we put on the armor. We never take it off. In one sense, we keep on putting on the armor of God. Are you wearing your armor today? And notice it's not a pick and choose option. It's the full armor of God, not just a couple of pieces. Putting on the armor of God is putting on our new identity in Christ. And everything that flows from that new identity. The life that we live flowing out of that new identity. What is your identity in Christ Jesus? Remember the things I talked about in the first week of this series. We talked about being a saint. We talked about being adopted children of Father God. 
We talked about being set free by Jesus. We talked about being sealed and guaranteed by the Spirit. And maybe you on a daily basis need to come before God and ask him to, rev- to just imagine in your mind's eye through the Spirit, Jesus speaking your new identity over you. And receive that identity, what the Bible says is true about you in Christ Jesus. So that's our strength. Secondly, our struggle. Let's move on one. Verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of the evil heavenly realms. I used to love watching wrestling as a kid. I used to go and watch the wrestling. I met Big Daddy one time, and then I'd collect videos. Remember videos? Anybody remember videos? Yeah. Um, I used to collect videos of wrestling. I even had this collection of Japanese women's wrestling. You can speak to me afterwards about that. Um, (laughs) Today, um, my my guilty pleasure is I'm a bit of a UFC fan, and this is uh, the UFC lightweight champion called Khabib Nurmagomedov. I think I pronounced that right. And he's one of the best wrestlers in the world and when Khabib fights he grabs his opponent he throws them to the ground and he keeps them on the ground and he mauls them for the duration of the fight the Greek word in this verse that's translated struggle is a wrestling term it's the only time it's used in the New Testament and it's about throwing down your adversary and keeping them pinned to the ground it would have been a common term in the Greco-Roman world. The Ephesians would have been well familiar with it from their inscriptions and from the wrestling at the games. And in fact, as we've talked about in this series, that Ephesus was well known for the worship of Diana and magical practices. And they had something called the Ephesian letters. And they were six names that people would use like a magical spell or incantation. And there was a famous wrestler who apparently wore the Ephesian letters on his ankle. And he was undefeated while he wore these Ephesian letters. And then the wrestling officials became aware of it. They made him take them off and he lost ten times in a row after that. This, they would know about this story. And Paul is telling them to put off the things they trust in in the past. And to trust in the power of God. And wrestling is the closest form of combat. It's a face-to-face encounter. Um, A friend of mine is like an Olympic wrestling coach, and he keeps trying to make me go to wrestling classes. So the other night, I went to a wrestling class, and it's a bit sweaty. You know what it's like. And Well, you might not know what it's like. And I came home after wrestling these guys, and I could smell other people's sweat on my arms. And it literally permeated my being because of how close the combat was. You know, we're, I've washed since then, it's all right. (laughs) We're all involved in a fight. We're all involved in a struggle. The person sitting next to you right now is involved in a struggle. It will be a different struggle to you. The nature of our struggles depend on our circumstances. It may be against temptation. It may be a habit. It may be an addiction. It may be chronic stress, panic attacks, or anxiety. We're all going through struggle. But Paul says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our fight is not against each other. We are not called to fight people but to love people. Let me read you what one writer said. He said, from a kingdom perspective, if it's got flesh and blood, if it's human, it's not our enemy. To the contrary, if it's got flesh and blood, it's someone we're commanded to love and thus someone we're to be fighting for, even if they regard us as their enemy. Our real battle is against the spiritual forces. Now, there's been a lot of debate about this verse and what the principalities and powers mean and what the nature of spiritual warfare is. I'm not going to get into that today, but one thing I would say, we are called to get on with doing the kingdom stuff. We free the captive. We look after the orphan. We feed the sick. We pray for people. We do the kingdom stuff. That's what God has called us to do. 
So finally, our stand. Let's move to the next slide. Standing is our goal. Paul calls us to take a stand four times in this passage. We're to stand firm. I don't know if, if you grew up, when I grew up, you'd remember the REM song, Stand. And Michael Stipe sings this, Stand in the place where you live. Stand in the place where you work. Our job is not to win. Our job is to stand in the light of Christ's victory. And today, I want to lift some stress and pressure off people who feel beaten down and they think, I've got to win, I've got to win. No, Jesus has won. You stand in that victory today. That's what God is calling you to do. Andrew Lincoln says this, the decisive victory has already been won by God in Christ. And the task of believers is not to win, but to stand. That is to persevere and maintain what, God, what has been won. It is because of this victory has been won that believers are involved in a battle at all. So let's quickly, to finish, look at the armor of God. The first thing is the belt of truth. We, this, this, the Roman belt with this leather girdle that held everything together. Think modern, modern example would be Batman's utility belt. Have you ever gone out and forgotten to wear a belt? And you're, how does it feel? You're worried, you're sort of pulling yourself up all the time because a, a belt stops our trousers falling down and leaving ourselves exposed. A belt wraps around us. We must wrap ourselves around in the truth. Rick Joyner says this, we must love truth. Pursue it and cling to it as our greatest treasure. And there is two aspects to this truth. There is the truth of Jesus and our identity in him. And then there is the true lives that Paul calls us to throughout the book of Ephesians. Secondly, there's the breastplate of righteousness. It was called the thoraca and stretched down from the neck to the thigh. And it would protect the vital organs. And if you look closely, mine sort of gives me a six-pack. So I'm thinking of wearing this at home this evening. Yeah, it's staying on, baby. <laughs> the modern equivalent would be the bulletproof vest. It protects our heart. And the heart is associated with feelings and emotions. And whenever the devil attacks us, it's often at the level of our emotions and our feelings. It's the blessed place of, blessed place of righteousness. What's righteousness? It's being made right in God's sight. It's being de- that courtroom image of being declared not guilty. But it's far more than that. It's a declaration of a right standing. The devil often will try to call into question our standing before God. Those voices that play in your mind accusing you. Well, Paul said all earlier in Ephesians, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Colossians 1.22 says, through the death of Christ, we are free from accusation the breastplate assures us of our standing before God but it's also calling us to right living because when we mess up it's like we leave a chink in our armor we leave a place where we are vulnerable to attack it's a weak point so we're called to right living Thirdly, the shoes of the gospel of peace they would be these military sandals actually these are Aldi's finest but hey it'll do and they would often be, have studs underneath to provide stability. Our spiritual feet need to be ready to move, ready for action. Our modern equivalent would be a pair of trainers that we put on, ready for a sporting event. And what do we put on? We put on the good news of peace. One writer said this, will we, we will be ready for war if we have peace on our feet. Christ himself, Paul says in Ephesians, has brought peace to us. He is our peace and the enemy will try and knock you down and stop you standing firm. But the peace of God helps us from slipping. But it's more than that. Ephesians 6.15 in the good news says this. And as your shoes, the readiness to announce the good news of peace. We are called to have beautiful feet In Isaiah, it says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. The good news of peace and salvation. The news that God of Israel reigns. 
Now, bit of self-disclosure, every two months, a woman comes to my house to make my feet beautiful. I have got, and she uses a scalpel and a drill. I've got a number if anybody wants it, literally, to give me beautiful feet. Have we got beautiful feet this afternoon? Do our lives and actions and words announce the good news of Jesus to the around us? Some people have smelly, horrible feet. But God wants us to have beautiful, spiritual feet. We can stand on the peace that Christ has brought us, that will give us a firm foundation. And then we move forward to introduce to people to the good news of Christ and to, so they can enter into the peace of God, life as it's meant to live. The shield of faith, it says, verse 16, in addition, take up the shield of faith. I'd rather the translation that says, at all times, carry the shield of faith. And it was a four foot by two foot shield, two layers of wood glued together, covered in leather that could be dipped in water to extinguish the fiery arts, darts even. And the modern equivalent is a police riot shield. Faith is believing God. It's trusting in the power of God and the identity that he gives us. It's our universal defense. It can extinguish the darts of temptation and accusation that are fired against us. And for some of us today, faith is not a amount of, I must try harder. Faith, Paul says in Ephesians, is a gift of God. And for some of you need to say today, God, give me more faith. And the word says, take up your shield. The other bits of the armor are fitted in place but we have to pick up our shield we have to pick up that faith and use it as we're in the battle has anybody seen the film gladiator and they're in the Colosseum, and they're fighting to amuse caesar and maximus is there with his men and what does he say lock your shields together as one and he gives that commandment that gives me the chill every time he shouts as one And they lock this shield because two-thirds of the shield would cover the soldier and there would be one-third left to cover the person next to them. And they would do this tortoise formation where they put the shield over and there would be this impenetrable barrier. We work together. We shield each other. Ephesians is all about the church working together as one unified body. And that's what we're celebrating in big church today. And there may be people next to you who will be in a wrestling match, in a struggle, and they need you to come with your shield and shield around them today. And your cry is, as one, as one, we stand together. Whatever struggle we're going through, we stand as one. And we move forward as one, united in Christ. But I'm preaching too long. The helmet of salvation. The Roman soldier's helmet would be bronze and it would protect their head and it would have the, the, the bit on top that had a crest holder and there would be plumes, often red. Oh, Amazon wasn't that good, I'm afraid. Um, the modern equivalent is the bicycle helmet. And I, when I grew up, I didn't wear a bicycle helmet. So I had my first drop handle bike. Three gears, come on, three gears. I know you're envious, Steve. Three gears. And then I went over the top. My mother was behind me, smashed my head on the curb, knocked myself out, stitches in my head, and I have the scar to this day. What does the helmet of salvation protect? It protects the mind. Because the place of spiritual battle is often in the mind. The helmet gives us protection that we have been saved. It helps us in the battle to know the now of salvation, the now of the kingdom. And the now of the kingdom is that God has broken through and you are saved, you are justified, you're made right in his sight and you can stand with confidence. But that plumage at the top was a powerful symbol of Rome and it gave the soldiers hope. So the helmet doesn't just give us protection, it gives us hope. And Paul talks about this in Thessalonians, that when a soldier went into battle with the symbol of Rome on his head, he knew he had the mighty power of victory behind him. And we know that our commander, Jesus, has won the victory. And that one day he will return and put all things right. That he's going to make, what does Aslan say, all the bad things come untrue. Every time you go on your bike, you put on a helmet before you start riding. Every day, remind yourself that you've been rescued by God, that you're a child of the King, that you've been made right in His sight, and that one day He will return 
and put all things right. Finally, the sword of the Spirit. The sword was a short sword. It wasn't made out of cardboard, I'm afraid. Um, And it was used for hand-to-hand close combat. And what does the Bible say? It says it's the word of God. It's about the good news of Jesus, but it's far more than that. It's the word of the, the Bible because notice when Jesus was attacked, when he was tempted in the wilderness, what did he do? It is written. He used the word to defend himself and he stood in the midst of temptation on the word of God. And it gives us the strength. You know, when Helen and I were in university, we memorized Psalm 23. And once you memorize scripture, it stays with you. But unfortunately, it's something I've sort of fallen out of practice doing. And I'd encourage you, start to memorize the Bible. If you want a good bit, start with the first 10 verses of Ephesians chapter 1 to memorize all the things that God says are true about you. The psalmist says, I've hidden thy word within your heart that I might not sin against you. Have a think. What piece of armor stands out most for you today? What do you need to grow in? Let's put the last slide up. I haven't got time to dwell on the last verses, which are all about prayer. And you can see there's a cheeky little three-point sermon there for anybody who wants it. Um, But prayer surrounds all the armor of God. And it's about praying in the Spirit as we do this, on all occasions, with all prayers for all people. Let's stand together. I'm going to read the last two verses of Ephesians over us as a prayer. These are the last two verses of Ephesians 6. Peace be with you, dear brothers and sisters. And may God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you love with faithfulness. May God's grace be eternally upon all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, everyone.